Hi everyone, welcome to episode 12 of a comprehensive review of dermatopathology. Today we're going to be covering neural and vascular tumors and how to approach them. So we'll start with neural things, both neuromas, nerve sheath tumors, neurofibromas, etc. So a neuroma is more of a proliferation of kind of maturely formed nerves, including traumatic neuromas, accessory digits, palisaded and capsulated neuroma. We're going to get perineuriomas, which are the cells surrounding the nerves, schwannomas, which are the nerve sheath, neurofibromas, um, and then kind of this entity previously known as a neurothecioma and what's happened with that naming, and then followed by granular cell tumors. So we'll start with neuromas um, and a traumatic neuroma, which is not exactly a tumor, it is just this proliferation of mature nerve bundles, kind of a tangle of nerve bundles when you damage a nerve in trauma or a procedure. And these can be seen as randomly scattered nerve tissues sorry, nerve bundles and scar tissue. And so here you can see in a background of kind of very red dense collagen, which is your fibrosis of your scar, you have these paler pink little aggregates occurring in strands and little bundles. And those are your nerve fibers. When we look up closer, you can see this is what nerve cells look like. They have, you know, an a spindled nucleus with tapered ends, as opposed to when we saw a muscle, it was kind of a blunted end. It depends on the direction of the cut. You can't always appreciate that very well. But one thing that I find to be wavy, because people have described the nuclei as wavy, and I never really appreciated wavy nuclei, but I find that the cytoplasm is actually wavy. So this kind of light pink wavy cytoplasm is what makes me think of something neural. And then if you look at the collagen, you see it's more whirly and chunky and red, and that's the color of collagen. And you know, a spindled cell in there would more likely be a fibroblast, right? So these are nerve cells versus fibroblast cells. And these kind of resemble mature nerves, and therefore this is a neuroma. And here is an S100 stain, which stains neural tissue, kind of highlighting where all these nerve bundles in are. Here in the epidermis, you can see it's highlighting melanocytes, and then here, nerve bundles that are occurring kind of in parallel because scar formation kind of stretches the collagen and compresses it into a parallel configuration. Palisade encapsulated neuroma is sort of a benign tumor-like proliferation of these more mature nerve bundles. It's well circumscribed. It's not really palisaded or encapsulated. These names are stuck with us, but it is arranged in fascicles because mature nerves occur in fascicles. And so it gives this appearance of a thumbprint pattern. So what are we talking about here? We have this well circumscribed nodule and you see these clefts here between these fascicles because these, if you imagine that this, you know, nerve bundle twists around and you're cutting it cross-sectionally, then you're going to see some bundles going side to side and some coming at you in a 2D plane. So here again are those pink kind of wavy cytoplasm taper-ended nuclei, which if you look in the cross-sections very much look like the mature nerves you see in the skin. And this is a neuroma or more specifically, a palisade encapsulated neuroma, which is probably the most common type of neuroma that we see. Here's even up closer to get a good look at the nerve tissue, okay? So a perineurioma is composed of perineural cells. It looks a little bit like a cross between a neurofibroma and a sclerotic fibroma. I have this differential called a sclerotic fibroma differential where you get that wood grain fibrotic pattern or sclerotic pattern. And if you see a lot of, if you see no cells in there, it's a sclerotic fibroma. If you see a lot of neutrophils in there, you're looking at erythema elevatum diutinum or EED. And if you see wavy spindled cells in there, then you think about this perineurioma, which is uh, an entity that is EMA positive, and that's kind of the favorite board's question about this. So here you see this sort of nodular configuration in the dermis, and when you look up close, can you appreciate the sort of wood grain sclerotic fibroma pattern? It's a little bit, you know, you see the white spaces because of the compressed collagen, and then as you lose the nuclei, when it goes from being fibrotic sclerotic, it kind of 
creates that look, but mixed inside there, there are these you know, wavy spindled cells. And this is what should make you think of a sclerotic perineurioma, okay? Wavy spindled cells mixed inside this background of you know, sclerosis. Here we go. So what's a schwannoma? Schwannoma is uh, a benign tumor of Schwann cells, and they create these antony A, or the varicae bodies, or antony B, which looks like a very loose meshwork, almost very mixoid neurofibroma look. And so you can have either of these patterns in a schwannoma. So here is a nice circumscribed encapsulated schwannoma, and from far away you can see these little aggregates of cells, and Different people see different things, but you see how the nuclei palisade on both sides and the wavy strands of cytoplasm are between them. I kind of imagine the mitotic process and like anaphase when the nuclei are separating. Other people see like a picket fence, or you can just say, oh, that's what a varicae body looks like. Regardless of the size, this is the configuration, palisading nuclei on both sides with strands kind of in between them. That's what Antony A, or the varicae bodies are, in a schwannoma. You see, it looks different than a mature nerve bundle, and it looks different than the kind of evenly distributed uh, neural-looking cells in a neurofibroma. Here's an up close, in case you couldn't see this palisaded nuclei with these little strands of wavy cytoplasm in between. Here is a a multi-lobulated schwannoma, so otherwise known as a plexiform schwannoma, which we see in, we can see it incidentally, or we can see it in neurofibromatosis type two. And up close, again, they're not as well defined as the other one, but you can see that palisade and these kind of varicase structures in here. So this is another schwannoma, otherwise known as a neural lemoma. Okay, lots of different names to learn. So again, doesn't look exactly like mature nerve bundles. It has more of this palisading look like the varicae bodies. So what's a neurofibroma? This is when you have these wavy cells kind of intermixed with the wavy collagen fibers. And that waviness confers that kind of squishiness that we feel in neurofibromas, where if you have kind of the collagen that's firm and stretched tight, that's when things are hard. So this waviness means it's fluffy. It blends into the peripheral collagen. There's no collagen trapping like you might see with a dermatofibroma. So here you see it blends into the collagen, okay? There's no grabbing and twisting of the collagen along the edge. And again, these neural cells have this paler pink color as opposed to the redder collagen. And then one thing that people note looking in closely is that you often have very dilated vessels. If you look even closer, you might see mast cells. But here, these are what I'm talking about. You see your nuclei have these tapered ends and your cytoplasm is wavy. And they're kind of intermixed with wavy collagen bundles. So a neurofibroma. This is a plexiform neurofibroma where you have a background of neurofibroma and these kind of additional lobules of these loose neurofibrominous tissue. Here it is up close. Again, wavy strands, vasculature, mast cell, neurofibroma. Okay, so what is a nerve sheath myxoma? This was previously referred to as a myxoid neurothechioma. And then there was a different one that was a cellular neurothechioma. But we've since decided that they actually probably have nothing to do with each other, especially because they stain differently. So they've been separated into two different names. So this is no longer called a myxoid neurothechioma. It is now called a nerve sheath myxoma. So these spindled cells are arranged in kind of a swirly concentric pattern. It often very much resembles a schwannoma with increased mucin, which makes sense because the name is nerve sheath myxoma. These are S100 positive and they're NKIC3 negative, S100 A6 positive. So here is a nerve sheath myxoma. You can see 
even though this image is of a slide that's slightly faded, there's this bluish tinge to it, and that's because there's increased mucin. And you can vaguely see this doesn't look so much like mature nerves, and it's kind of more whirly than the neurofibroma pattern. You can almost make out weak varicase shapes. So this is nerve sheath, and there's extra mucin, so it's a nerve sheath myxoma. Okay. Neurothechioma, on the other hand, which used to be referred to as cellular neurothechioma, is now only called neurothechioma, is S100 negative. And so, you know, it was thought that maybe it was neural because NKIC3 tends to stain um, kind of neural cresty type cells. However, we're finding that they also stain fibrohistiocytic tumors. So it's possible that this is a fibrohistiocytic tumor and shouldn't be in the neural chapter at all. But for now, it's, you know, by convention still here. What you have is nests and fascicles of cells that are slightly round, slightly spindled. They vaguely resemble melanocytes sometimes. They vaguely resemble histiocytes, but not quite. And they are set in a hyalinized stroma. So this is one version of a neurothechioma. These cells are more round and they kind of look like melanocytes or histiocytes, but this hyalinized thick collagenous background is somewhat unusual for those. And then if they stain with the NKIC3, but they're S100 negative, that's when you start thinking, oh, this is probably a neurothechioma. See, these cells look very much like melanocytes or histiocytes, but they're not quite right, especially with that stroma. Here's another up close. Here's another neurothechioma. You see how well circumscribed it is? And that's because of this very, very sclerotic stroma that kind of binds it together. And that's sort of like a benign feature. And it sort of makes you think of something fibrohistiocytic. Like we remember from, you know, the dermatofibroma chapter, fibrohistiocytic things are these cells that can be round or spindled and make kind of a collagenous stroma. And this is what we have here. So that's probably why this is not in the right chapter. But these cells look quite different than those other ones. They're not as round, they're more spindled and the nests are smaller, but you know they still have this vaguely melanocytic, histiocytic look on a sclerotic background. So that's the only thing that sort of points me towards a neurothechioma is walking through that kind of, these are aggregates, are they melanocytic? No, are they histiocytic? No, there's a sclerotic background. Oh, maybe it's a neurothechioma. Okay, sorry, I don't have a more sophisticated um, thought process for you there. So here these cells are again, up close, more on the spindled side than on the round side, which we see in fibrohistiocytic tumors. All right, and then there's a granular cell tumor, which a lot of people don't realize belongs in the neural chapter because they, we think they may be of Schwann cell origin and they are S100 positive. So you get these cells, these round cells in the dermis or subcutis, and when you look, they have these red granular cytoplasm. And so the different cytoplasms make a big difference in our diagnoses, and so it is helpful to have you know, sit granular next to foamy, next to ground glass, and kind of see the differences between them all. Here's another one. This is a much larger tumor. When you look up close, these cells are round and they have this red granular cytoplasm. I would say granular is finer than foamy. Foamy, you'll see individual little, little, little circle balls, and then coarser than ground glass, which is like a fine, a fine Caribbean sand, okay? Neuroendocrine tumors. So Merkel cell carcinoma is sort of our prototype for this. This is a blue tumor. Um, they say the nuclei are smudgy and there's multiple nucleoli. To me, it kind of looks like you have these blue cells smashed up against a piece of glass, and that's what they look like to me. They fit together really snugly. They are CK20 positive and CK7 negative. And the main differential is other neuroendocrine tumors, such as tumors from the lung that could have metastasized. So a TTF1 is traditionally negative in Merkel cell carcinoma and positive in tumors from other sites. And then neuroendocrine stains like synaptophysin and chromogranin are usually positive as well. So here's your blue tumor in your sun damaged skin. And you look up close, 
and you have these kind of smudgy blue cells. You see how they look kind of like they're smashed up against the glass and there's, you know, not clear borders, but they're all kind of on the very same plane as each other. And you can see they have multiple nucleoli. No palisading like you might expect in a basal cell carcinoma. They don't have the stroma either. Okay, this is what neuroendocrine cells look like. So now we've covered all the spindles. So let's take one last look. As a reminder, here's neural spindles, right? Wavy cytoplasm, nuclei with little tapered ends. That's a neural look. This is a fibroblast look. The cytoplasm of fibroblast is collagen, right? So they're more red, a little bit more firm, not quite as loose and wavy. And they're, they tend to be more tapered ended um, cells as well. Muscle, on the other hand, has these blunt ended nuclei and these little white clearings, the glycogen snacks everywhere. And that's what helps you identify smooth muscle, okay? All right, moving on to vascular tumors. So we have some benign vascular proliferations. Remember, vascular includes lymphatic vessels and blood vessels. A few different subcategories of hemangioma to go over. We have this angiolymphoid hyperplasia with eosinophilia, otherwise known as epithelioid hemangioma, to kind of go over pyogenic granuloma, glomus tumors, and then a few infectious things and cancer. So lymphangioma are dilated vascular spaces filled with lymph. Not very complicated. They tend to rise up fairly superficially to the epidermis, which is why you often have that look of frog spawn, like little clear vesicles under the skin. Okay, and these are filled almost entirely with lymphatic fluid. You have a few little red blood cells, but mostly lymphatic fluid. Okay, dilated vessels. You see these spaces are lined with these tiny, thin endothelial cells. So later when we look at the tumors, you're gonna to wanna to compare what a normal, thin, little endothelial cell is to a, an atypical endothelial cell. This is something we might call a lymph hemangioma. So remember, when your capillaries reach the very ends toward the top of your skin, they meet the lymphatic channels. So you'll have a mixture of blood and lymph and so if it's mostly blood, we call it a hemangioma, and that might correlate with your cherry angioma you see clinically. If it's purely lymphatic, it might be lymphangioma circumscriptum, but if it's half and half, sometimes we'll call it a lymph hemangioma, which is not that clinically significant. We just like to you know, call it as we see it. So lymphatic fluid, blood, and it just depends on the proportion that you've got. Okay, see some of these vessels have both of them. Up close, you can look at your little endothelial cells. You usually don't see much cytoplasm. All right, so what's an angiokeratoma? An angiokeratoma is basically a hemangioma, which means benign proliferation of blood vessels that's tucked right underneath a hyperkeratotic epidermis, okay? Often has a little collarette of epithelium around it. They often get traumatized and thrombose, so you'll see little balls of fibrin in them. So see this one's traumatized, that's why your blood is spilled out into the cornified layer. But here you have this epithelial collarette, right? Very dilated blood vessels. And then here's your hyperkeratotic, meaning thick cornified layer surface, okay? And that makes an angiokeratoma. And you can see here you have blood and you have this other gummy pink color, which is your fibrin, which tells you your vessel has been damaged. These stick out, they're little scaly, people always pick at them. Here's another one. It's a little bit digitated on top. Here's your collarette, thick hyperkeratosis, and here are your vessel spaces. See, this one has prominent lymphatic vessels also, and that's filled with a fibrin ball, and your blood is up in your cornified layer because, of course, it's been traumatized, okay? Your fibrin ball is filled with these little endothelial cells that start to make little vascular channels so intravascular papillary endothelial proliferation, right, which is mesons, and eventually you get enough open spaces that blood starts flowing again. That's what an organizing thrombus is. So as a review, mesons is intravascular papillary endothelial hyperplasia, and basically exuberant organization and recanalization of a thrombus. 
So this is a big blood vessel. You can see a big muscular vessel wall and then a giant thrombus ball in the middle with some hemorrhage and this brown is all hemosiderin because it's been there a while. And then when you look up close, so here's your muscular wall, your hemosiderin, your blood and your fibrin ball. Muscular wall, right? Our little glycogen snacks and our smooth muscle. Here's your fibrin ball and you have your endothelial cells making little papillary projections. Like when things like snake around like this, they use the word papillary and they create little open vascular channels for blood to come through until they make enough little channels that it flows again. So what's a hemangioma? The pathology term is hemangioma, which means benign proliferation of blood vessels. You have clinical terms, which are like cherry angioma, because clinically it looks like a little cherry to you, but we don't use that term histopathologically, okay? So a cherry angioma is a collection of thin-walled blood vessels in the upper dermis, otherwise known as hemangioma. You might have an arteriovenous hemangioma where your vessels are more thick-walled, um, and then we have some other variations we'll go over as well. So here is an, sort of an, angio, an arteriovenous hemangioma, because as you can see, if the whole hemangioma was formed by these little thin-walled vessels, it would just be a cherry. But then if you have some more of these thick-walled vessels, that's when we start calling them the AV hemangiomas. But they all kind of look like cherries to you. If you have larger blood vessels and they go deeper, some people call these cavernous hemangiomas, the deeper the blood vessel, the more you visually see it as a blue lesion, as opposed to if it's very superficial, you will more visually see it as a red lesion, okay? And that's just because of the way light shines through the skin. But you see these thin walled vessels, quite large, filled with blood. A microvenular hemangioma is when your vessels are kind of squashed and small. So it's a benign proliferation of thin walled vessels, but instead of being nice and round like we just saw, they're kind of compressed and skinny. See, but you can see up close that these are all endothelial cells with little vascular spaces. So this is a microvenular hemangioma. A targetoid hemosiderotic hemangioma, otherwise known as a hobnail hemangioma, is another one. So if you imagine it's targetoid clinically because the center is red and the sides are brownish, and that's because the center of these always has these widely dilated vessels, and then it progresses to these more slit-like vessels on the side, and you have a lot of extravasated erythrocytes that eventually deposit hemosiderin, which is brown. So you'll have red and purple and brown on these targets. Up close, here's the dilated part, and you can see, you see these little slit-like vessels on the sides, and then you'll see a lot of extravasated erythrocytes. And then with the extravasated erythrocytes, eventually you'll have deposition of hemosiderin. They also call it a hobnail hemangioma because see your endothelial cells, rather than laying parallel to the wall and just being skinny, they often stick inward like this. This is not specific to hobnail hemangioma. You can see hobnailing with other things like capaces, but it's just a finding that was noted in these lesions when they were named. So hobnail means these little endothelial cells are kind of sticking inward. A glomeruloid hemangioma. These are sort of lobulated and shaped like the glomerulus of a kidney. Um, they're dilated vascular spaces and they have grape-like clusters of little vessels with eosinophilic globules, which are actually immunoglobulin. So, these are seen in association with the POEM syndrome. And as a review, POEM stands for polyneuropathy, organomegaly, endocrinopathy, M protein, right? And skin changes, i.e. these glomeruloid hemangiomas. So this is one where this is supposed to remind you of a glomerulus. When you look up close, you see there's blood. This is a vascular tumor. These little globules that are inside the cells are actually not blood. These are the M protein. They stain with immunoglobulin, okay? Angiolymphoid hyperplasia with eosinophilia. That's this kind of not very well understood, possibly reactive condition that we see in the head and neck usually as these red plaques. And it's also been called an epithelioid hemangioma because there's this 
lymphoid and eosinophilic infiltrate, but also a very prominent vascular component where the vessels are very epithelioid, meaning the endothelial cells are round, plump, and endothelioid, sorry, epithelioid. But I've seen these incidentally as hemangiomas where they are not clinically consistent with angiolymphoid hyperplasia with eosinophilia. Regardless, what do we see? We see collections of vessels with round, plump endothelial cells and mixed inflammatory cells. So here's one case. When you look up close, I mean, this one's not very prominent, but you can see your endothelial cells are round and plump and you have a lymphoid infiltrate with prominent eosinophils. Here's another look at it. A lot of blood vessels, plump endothelial cells, and often it's much more dense than this, but you have lots of lymphs and lots of eos. Here's another look. This one you can see slightly more prominent vascular proliferation. And you can see rather than those little skinny endothelial cells we saw in the beginning, you have much more plump, round, epithelioid blood vessels. Pyogenic granuloma. This is otherwise known as a lobular capillary hemangioma. And so what is it really? It's, it's like over vascularized granulation tissue. So early on, you see a lot of little small blood vessels. Often they have very minimal blood inside of them, surrounded by edema and mixed inflammation, which is kind of exactly what granulation tissue looks like. The older the lesion, the less edema there is and the more fibrosis there is, just kind of like the way granulation tissue progresses. So here's an example, it's lobular, meaning that it occurs in like little round lobules. You often have like a little collarette. Here, this white space is all this edema and it looks very cellular because in the beginning, it's a lot of little endothelial cells forming little micro vessels. You also have inflammation. Here you have blood extravasated, but not a ton of blood inside the vessels. Here's your edema. And then here's another look. They're often, see, this one's traumatized. So you've got all the fibrin. They're very friable, right? Especially early on when you have so much granulation tissue. And then eventually this, this edema gets replaced by red fibrosis and then the vessels kind of consolidate. You might have larger, more dilated vessels, and then it can be difficult to distinguish these from a cherry angioma. Okay, here's another one. See how very little blood is inside the vessels? This is kind of a traumatized area that's bleeding, but it's very cellular. Not all cells are making very obvious blood vessels. It's like forming them, and then there's some inflammation in the background. A glomus tumor. So there's a glomangioma, glomulovenous malformation, all these different names. I think a lot of those distinctions have to be made clinically. So if I see glomus cells making a vascular tumor, I just call it glomus tumor. And then if you note that there is a malformation clinically, then it's likely a malformation. Some people have said if the vascular component looks more prominent, it's probably the malformation and if the glomus cells themselves are more prominent it's more likely the tumor but you know these things are fairly subjective so there's not a lot of inter-observer um, consensus but these glomus cells are really round monomorphous little cells that surround the vascular spaces that kind of help squeeze the vessel and move the blood along so here you go this is a little tumor and you can see these vascular spaces right and when you look up close you can confirm that there are blood vessel spaces because in a few of them you can see blood. And then when you look at the tumor cells, they're very round and monomorphous. Okay, little blood cells, little blood cells. See, these are your endothelial cells. So they are not endothelial cells. They're the cell right outside the endothelial cell. That's the glomus cell. Vascular angiomatosis. So this kind of looks PG-like, right, pyogenic granuloma-like, and it's caused by a bacterial infection, Bartonella hensilae and Bartonella quintana. They make small collections of blood vessels with plump endothelial cells, and then the infiltrate has many neutrophils, which is something we'd expect to see in an infection. And near these infiltrates, which is where you wanna go if you're looking for organisms, you'll see this granular material, and those are the bacteria. Okay, so here you can see in the section of skin, there is a 
little proliferation. Can you see this half dome of increased cellularity? When you're up close, you can see there's lots and lots and lots of increased blood vessels with an edematous background. You might think PG, but going in closer, you're like, oh, well, there's a lot of neutrophils here. And then look at these. You see this purple area here? And there's a few other little purple areas where you have little collections of this granular, very fine granular material, and that's your organism. Here's another one, a demonous background, but you sort of see this circular aggregate of messiness, which up close is a lot of inflammation, a lot of edema, and a lot of blood vessels. Going in closer, you see that there's a lot of neutrophils, and this is that granular purplish material. That is your Bartonella organism. Okay, moving on. We're still sort of in infections, but also in uh, pseudoneoplastic things. So Kaposi's sarcoma, even though it's called sarcoma, is actually a reactive process rather than a true sarcoma because it can involute. Now, there is a patch stage and a plaque stage. In the patch stage, you're starting with these kind of jagged vascular spaces, and they're lined by plump endothelial cells. So these endothelial cells are plumper than usual, but they're relatively monomorphous, meaning they look like one another. They're not pleomorphic, meaning they look different from one another. The new vascular channels surround existing vascular channels, and this creates the promontory sign. So if you kind of think about a 3D proliferation of blood vessels, when you cut it and you look at it 2D, you're gonna see a vessel within a vessel. When it's nodular, and very cellular, they create these slit-like splices that are very bloody looking, and you'll see plasma cells. And if you're not sure, you can always do an HHV8 immunostain to confirm the diagnosis. So this is more of a patch stage of capsies. And the first thing you do is you note, oh, there's these crack-like spaces and increased cellularity in the dermis. How are you gonna get to vascular tumor from here? Well, the crack-like spaces, you might wonder, are those artifact or are they something else? So you look at them and you wanna know, are they lined or are they not lined? You see how they're lined by endothelial cells? So these are vascular spaces and see, you've got a red blood cell in there. So this is truly a vascular space rather than an artifactual cleft. And you can see your endothelial cells are a little plumper than normal blood vessels but they're not crazy looking and they kind of look like each other. You have to remember things might be going side to side or they might be coming at you. So they might be more round or more parallel. That's not what I'm talking about in terms of pleomorphism or monomorphism. I'm saying they're all about the same color, about the same size, and when cut in the same direction, they all look about the same. This is your promontory sign. See here you have a vessel going in and out from the screen, and then you have a vessel here going side to side, up and down all different directions. So that's the promontory sign. You have a 3D proliferation of vessels kind of cut in cross section. You can obviously see a promontory in angiosarcoma too, because that's also a proliferation of blood vessels. In fact, you see plasma cells in capaces because it's a chronic infection but you can see plasma cells in tumors too. So you'll see plasma cells in angiosarcoma also. So really for me, what makes the distinction is these nuclei. These nuclei are very monomorphous in capaces and they are pleomorphic in angiosarcoma. So here's nodular capaces and this can look really scary. Spindle cell differential, we saw smooth muscle, we saw neural, we saw fibroblastic and now we have to kind of decide, well, what are these? And these are sort of, see, when you look at the side to side ones, they're spindled and there's a lot of blood. So that might make you think, oh, this must be vascular. But you might look around also for these cells making an obvious little slit like vessel space where the blood is contained right in the space telling you, yeah, I think these are vascular, okay? But basically you're taking this endothelial cell that surrounds the vessel and you're multiplying it going outward. And if you look at these, they're all about the same color, size. There's not a ton of pleomorphism. Angiosarcoma, on the other hand, has a lot more. So this has been described as a dry riverbed, right? Those white irregular spaces. We're not looking at little round vessel spaces anymore. We're looking at these little river, riverlet extensions. And you see some true atypia. 
the tumor can also be very cellular where you can barely tell that it's, you know, a vascular tumor. So this is the patch bruise-like stage of angiosarcoma. Again, you have these white crack-like spaces and you're like, oh, is that artifact? No, I don't think so because look, they're lined by endothelial cells and you can see bloods, red blood cells inside the lumen. So these are true vascular spaces. But compared to the Kaposi sarcoma, look at these endothelial cells. We'll compare them side by side later, but they're much larger. You see some, and they're different in color. Some are very hyperchromatic, meaning very black, lots of chromatin, and some are not as hyperchromatic, and they're lighter and almost open chromatin, meaning very pale. They're different sizes, different shapes. They're more pleomorphic than the other ones, okay? And that's really the way that I tell that I'm looking at angiosarc versus Kaposi's. This is a very cellular one. Up here in these white spaces, you can make out that you're making vascular spaces. Down here, where it becomes a more solid tumor, it can be very difficult to tell that you're dealing with angiosarcoma. So here are these very irregular vascular spaces. Look, a promontory. So again, not specific to Kaposi's. But if you look at your endothelial cells, they look very different from one another. Okay, so should immediately make you think of an atypical vascular tumor. And this is what it looks like deeper down. You have solid sheets of these cells. You know, it's fairly poorly differentiated. You might wonder, are those melanocytes? Are those atypical squamous cells? You know, what are they? You might have to stain for it. But here you can see that they line these vessel spaces. So that gives you a clue that you're dealing with <clears throat> a vascular tumor. See, there's blood inside the lumen. It's not like between the cells, meaning that it's just a bloody tumor, okay? See how pleomorphic these cells are? So here's a side-by-side -side of capices. So look at capices and look at these nuclei. They're plumper than normal. They hobnail a little, but they're not crazy looking. And look at angiosarcoma. They're much larger and they are more pleomorphic. And that's it.